A one foot long, two pound creature is pulled from the deep ocean. It's brought to the Toba Aquarium on the east coast of Japan, where it was put on display as number one. It was the first of its kind ever kept in captivity, but even its captors didn't know that this big crab-like ocean dweller was about to become the most famous animal in the entire aquarium, and maybe even all of Japan. For a while, everything was fine. Number one explored its tank. It moved slowly, but seemed healthy. But then, on January 2nd, 2009, something changed. It was feeding time as usual. Number one nibbled lightly on some horse mackerel, then suddenly stopped eating and walked away. It didn't finish its meal, and while one skip meal is a little odd, that was the last time that number one ever ate. Its caretaker, Takeya Moritaki, couldn't figure out what was wrong. He pushed the food closer, no reaction. He tried offering different foods, still no reaction. Number one would either ignore the food, push it away, or slowly wander off. He even pushed number one's face directly toward the food, nothing. He adjusted the water temperature, hoping it would help, maybe make it more comfortable or hungrier, still no change. Weeks passed, then months, then years. Number one didn't eat anything through all of the entire 2009. Word began to spread that a strange deep sea creature at Toba Aquarium was on a hunger strike. People started showing up just to witness its feeding sessions, though starvation sessions was more accurate. Number one still wouldn't eat. According to reports, it eventually learned how to pretend it was eating, moving its mouth and front legs around the food just to trick its keepers. But it never actually took a bite. 2009 passed, then 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. For four straight years, it did nothing but play with its food. No animal in captivity had ever refused food for that long, at least and was still alive. And then, on Valentine's Day of 2014, Moritaiki arrived with a fresh piece of mackerel. He lowered it into the tank. Number one didn't move. He leaned in, gently picked the creature up, and realized it was no longer alive. Later research on its remains showed no signs of illness or injury. It hadn't been sick. It hadn't suffered anything that at least the scientists could see. It had simply stopped eating for 1,868 consecutive days. Thousands followed number one story over the years. News outlets covered its every non-meal. Fans online debated theories. Some joked it was just picky. Others swore it was depressed. But when it finally died, Japan mourned. People left flowers, notes, little mackerel plushies by the tank. This wasn't just some crustacean anymore. Number one had become a symbol of patience, of mystery, and of the deep sea's refusal to give up its secrets. And fittingly, it wasn't just any animal either. Number one was a giant isopod, a deep sea scavenger armored like a tank and known for its ability to resist pressure, time, and apparently all counts of food. And yet the question still haunts us. Why did number one stop eating? Did it die of starvation or something else? Was there something the aquarium could have done differently? And how the hell did it survive without food for over five years? At the bottom of the ocean, where sunlight never reaches, lives this creature that looks like a cross between a cockroach and an armored tank. That's not just an insult either. Giant isopods are part of the ancient arthropod family. The same group that includes everything from crabs and shrimp to spiders and yes, cockroaches. But while cockroaches evolved to scurry through leaf litter and kitchen floors, giant isopods took to the deep sea where food is scarce Pressure is crushing, and the cold would stop most life in its tracks. On top of that, they don't have speed. They crawl from a sluggish pace of about 0.2 to 0.4 miles per hour. They don't have venom, 
or even strong claws. No stealth tech, no camouflage tricks. They're not intelligent either, at least not compared to deep sea elites like octopuses or squid, which show problem solving and memory. Even dolphins and some fish have complex social behavior. The isopod is solitary, slow, and unable to do anything that its instincts don't tell it to. So how does a creature this useless survive? How does a creature with no speed, no smarts, and no offensive weapons make it in the most unforgiving environment on the planet? Despite their alien looks, part cockroach, part trilobite, giant isopods are surprisingly close cousins of the pull bugs in your backyard. Yep, those tiny gray bugs that roll up when you poke them. Same family. But while some of their common ancestors stayed on land, the other ones dove into the ocean depths and just kept going for 7,000 feet down. Giant isopods belong to the order Isopoda, a lineage that's been around over 300 million years. And while most people think of Barthinomus giganteus when they think of giant isopods, there are actually 20 known species of giant isopods, ranging in size and distribution. Some are mere five inches, Others look like they should be fighting Godzilla under the sea. All of them share the same general strategy. Armor up, slow down, eat when you can, and wait. For a shark to pass, so that you can pull the ultimate choke slam on it. Now, giant isopods aren't exactly known for being aggressive hunters, but this clip shows them feasting on a dog shark, a rare moment of an isopod taking down a live meal. It was likely captured off an oil rig, where these scavengers can occasionally encounter large, unsuspecting prey. But what makes this moment even more chilling is the fact that isopods are ruthless opportunists, and the understanding that for these deep-sea creatures, this kind of event doesn't happen often. They don't hunt, they wait. And when they eat, it's usually a feast scavenged from the aftermath of a larger predator. For example, this ROV footage shows an isopod scavenging on a fish head, probably after the fish was taken down by a bigger predator. Food is rare on the ocean floor. There are no plants, no plankton blooms, no hunting grounds bustling with prey. What does exist is a trickle of dead stuff, fish, squid, and even whale carcasses that drift down from above, and this is where the giant isopod shines. It is a scavenger par excellence. When a carcass hits the seafloor, it's a feast for them. They use their antenna to detect chemical cues in the water and navigate towards the source. Their eyes, though large and reflective, aren't much help in the pitch black environment. Instead, it's all about scent, touch, and timing. In the absence of photosynthesis, Every nutrient matters. A dead tuna can become an entire buffet. And the isopods are often the first to arrive and the last to leave. This cleanup work prevents disease, aids in nutrient cycling, and supports the odd food web that exists below. When they do find food, they gorge. Some experts think that this is one of the reasons why number one was observed devouring so much in captivity that it didn't have to eat again for over five years. This hints at just how extreme their adaptability is. Why it stopped eating, or whether it was starving itself or preparing to die, remains a mystery. Anyway, in the deep sea, it's not about eating often. It's about eating enough to last through the famine. This is one of their greatest survival adaptations, an absurdly slow metabolism that allows them to outweigh almost everything else down here. But even this is not enough reason for how they thrive on the ocean floor. To understand the giant isopod's lifestyle, it's important to understand where it lives. These armored crustaceans are found as deep as 2,000 meters below the surface, mostly in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Down there, the pressure can exceed 200 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. That would flatten most surface creatures like a pancake. But for the giant isopod, it's just another Tuesday. Their bodies are low to the ground and built like a mini tank 
with a flattened domed shell that can curl inward when threatened. This curling behavior, known as conclubation, isn't just defensive flare. It allows the isopod to protect its soft underside from both predators and rough terrain. Think of it as the deep sea version of curling into a ball when the will gets too hard, just like an armadillo does. You'd think a creature this armored wouldn't have to worry, and once they're grown, that's mostly true. But juvenile or molting isopods on times when their armor is softer and they're more vulnerable are another story. Large deep sea fish, crabs, and even octopuses can prey on them. But once they're full-sized and armored up, they're essentially the medieval tanks of the benthic world, and this is true for both males and females of the species. In giant isopods, sexual dimorphism is subtle. Males tend to be a bit bigger with longer antennae. And that's it. No big difference between the two genders. During mating season, it's believed that giant isopods may use chemical cues like pheromones, to locate each other in the endless dark. Once fertilized, the female carries her eggs in a brood pouch, or marsupium, until they hatch. And these aren't ordinary eggs. They're among the largest of any marine invertebrate, giving the young a head start. When they hatch, there's no larval stage. Just fully formed, armored mini isopods, ready to crawl out and face the deep, in a place where food is rare and danger never sleeps. There's no time for childhood. This defense first lifestyle is why they don't evolve flashy speed, venom, or intelligence. When you built like a submarine and nobody's in a hurry, there's no need to outrun anything. You just survive. In many ways, the deep sea has served as a time capsule for them. Because in the deep sea, speed wastes energy. Intelligence is useless if there's nothing to outsmart. And venom? That's just extra baggage in a place where the next meal might not come for months or even years. There's less change, fewer predators and fewer competitors. Evolution down here moves slower, so traits that work will tend to stick around for eons. This is part of why giant isopods look prehistoric. They are. Deep in the oceans, it's hard to study them, and keeping them in aquariums isn't a walk in the park either. They require deep tanks, cold water, and very specific pressure conditions to thrive. In captivity, they've revealed even more of their odd habits. Some refuse to eat for years, even when food is provided. Others become uncharacteristically active when handled, flipping themselves over like slow-motion gymnasts. But all of this takes the background when you start thinking about their size. One of the most striking things about the giant isopod is, of course, their size. Their land-based cousins are barely an inch long. So why does the deep sea version look like it could wrestle a lobster? This phenomenon is called deep sea gigantism. And while scientists haven't pinned down a single explanation, there are a few leading theories. Cooler temperatures at depth slow down metabolism and extend lifespan. Two things that over evolutionary time can result in larger body sizes. There's also less predation pressure and competition, which allows species to grow without needing to be agile or small to survive. If you'd like me to do a full in-depth on all the reasons why scientists think these deep sea creatures get so damn big, then just leave a comment. There's also the resource aspect. Being large may allow the isopod to store more nutrients from a rare meal, kind of like having a bigger fuel tank in a place with no gas stations. Everything about the giant isopod is slow. It moves slowly. It eats slowly. Or not at all. It grows slowly, breeds slowly, and reacts slowly. But that's not a weakness. It's a perfectly tuned strategy for surviving in a world where action and abundance are rare and patience is everything. Its body plan hasn't changed much in hundreds of millions of years. Its way of life is the definition of minimalist survival, and that's part of what makes it so fascinating in a world obsessed with speed, flash, and flare. The giant isopod is proof that you can still win by going slow and stay armored up. Maybe number one didn't want to eat. Maybe it couldn't. 
Maybe it wasn't built to live in a world with glass walls and curious eyes. But for five years, this creature endured what we couldn't do for a month. We still don't know what happened to number one, but its life and death forced researchers to ask new questions about the limits of what deep sea creatures can actually do. Maybe the giant isopod survival strategy really is so last year, or so last hundred million years. But in this kind of realm, don't try to change what isn't broken.